So it wouldn't be a iRecord symposium if we didn't have somebody from iRecord chatting to us today. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Martin Harvey, who is the person that actually first even signposted me to iRecord some, I think, 10 years ago on a, on a, on a training course, Martin, uh, his wildlife in the cloud training course at Easter Run for the Field Studies Council. So I'm really, really pleased to welcome, welcome him here today to tell us about what the UKCH and Biological Record Centre are doing to support iRecord and what might be coming in the not too distant future. So over to you, Martin. Thanks very much, Karen, and uh, yeah, thanks very much to you and to NFBR um, for putting on this session today. I've thoroughly enjoyed seeing the talks this morning and um, seeing all sorts of ways that people are using iRecord that I, I wasn't necessarily aware of. Um, so that, that's been great. Um, so as Kieran says, um, I'm based at, well, I'm, I'm, I'll talk about who's involved with iRecord in a moment, but iRecord is maintained as one of the, the things that the Biological Record Centre does. The Biological Record Centre is a unit within the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. So just to get all those sort of organisations out of the way, that's, that's where we're based and that's where it all comes from. Um, but I'd like to sort of start straight away um, by just finding out a little bit more about who we've got in the audience today. So this is just a simple question about your links to iRecord at the moment. If um, Kieran can, oh, can, can I launch? I think I might be able to launch that actually. Be to it, Martin, it's already there. Right, great. So you might wanna make this uh, window a little bit bigger because there's a lot of options, guys. It is multiple choice. Martin's asking you, how do you use iRecord? Uh, and just quickly read through the options. Uh, I add records to iRecord or an iRecord app. I add records to a, another website or app that is linked to iRecord. I'm a verifier on iRecord. I am a local environmental record center where we download iRecord records. Or I am from a local environmental record center where we do not download iRecord records. Uh, other options are most of my iRecord uses as a volunteer, most of my iRecord uses as a professional, and I have never used iRecord or the Indicia-based uh, applications that iRecord is part of me of. Right, we've got most of them, Martin. Are you happy yep. for me to end that and then yep, you can sure. talk through the results? So everyone should be able to see the results there. I'll let you talk through it, Martin. Great. Um, yeah, so I was, I was interested to see what uh, sort of range of people we've got involved. And um, unsurprisingly, I guess, given that this was a symposium devoted to iRecord, uh, most of the uh, largest proportion of, of our audience are people who have used iRecord in one way or another. Um, we've got quite a few verifiers on board. That's good to see. Thank you. And um, quite a few representatives from some of the local record centres, um, including one that, uh, at least one that doesn't uh, download data from iRecord currently. Um, so there may be a conversation there that we could pick up on later on if uh, anybody wants to know more about that side of things. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's very useful to see. Thank you. I think we can move on from there. So most of you then are obviously familiar with the concept of iRecord and we've had lots of information about it already. Uh, and as you're aware, lots of people are using it. It's not the only biological recording system out there, as we've said already this morning, um, but it is being used very widely. There are over 22 million records altogether in the system at the moment. And I thought I'd just have a quick look at the records just this month. Well, it's sort of two thirds of the way through April. And since the beginning of April this year, the map there shows the spread of records that have been added already, which I think is pretty impressive. Um, and if anybody wants to have a quick guess with themselves as to which species has been most frequently recorded since the 1st of April, the answer is peacock butterfly. And normally butterflies come out on top of these sorts of um, things because uh, partly because um, so much of butterfly conservation is recording and the, the butterfly transects and so on all get fed into the, the same database. So butterflies are usually at the top. Um, what about the most recorded species that isn't a butterfly? 
Well, I'm absolutely delighted to tell you that that is the bee fly. Um, I have the great fun and pleasure of looking after the soldier flies recording scheme, which runs the bee fly watch each spring. And uh, that is the species that is non butterfly species that has been most recorded this month. So well done, everybody who's been sending in their bee fly records. And that's closely followed by grey squirrels, the most recorded mammal this month. So there's lots of recording going on. Um, the other thing that I think has been sort of strongly hinted at at various times this morning, but I just wanted to go over it again, just to, because not everybody understands this. Uh, and that is the difference between I record and this word indicia that we've used a few times and the various other systems that are linked into it. And all the different recording platforms that we're looking at on the screen here are recording platforms that all look quite different. They're all set up to do different jobs in different ways, but all of them are linked in to the same underlying data warehouse, and all of them use the same software, which goes under the name of Indicia. Uh, and that software is open source software that anybody can use to build a biological recording platform online and can choose to share the data with the iRecord um, sort of infrastructure uh, and th at the iRecord end of things is where the verification happens um, but all these all these different systems are all feeding into this process and one of the main benefits of having all these different systems feeding into the process is for the verification so that verifiers can gain access to all these records um, that might have been put in in lots of different places for lots of different reasons um, but they all come to the verifier for that particular species group uh, who can access them all in one go. It also allows us to um, assist with sharing the records out again to the local record centres and through to MBN Atlas and beyond. So really what we've been trying to achieve over the years with the iRecord system is to allow the recorder in the field to be able to very quickly and relatively easily, we hope, get their records into the system one way or another using either the iRecord website or app or one of these linked systems all those records become immediately available to national recording schemes and their local county recorders who play the major role in verification they also become immediately available to the local record centers and through the national recording schemes they can then flow on to the nbn atlas to be disseminated more widely there and from nbn atlas they go right the way up to the global biodiversity information facility and can and are used to feed into global research on biodiversity change and um, related issues so the system does enable this relatively rapid um, sharing of records from out in the field up to the world more recently, we've started to link in some other systems, and again, these have been mentioned already this morning. iNaturalist UK records do uh, feed into iRecord once they meet certain conditions and can fit into this data flow and get a further verification check and then get fed on beyond there. And we do now have a link with BirdTrack. BirdTrack is the leading system for bird records, but it does also pick up on some other species groups nowadays, and those non-bird groups are flowing into iRecord for verification. And we've been saying for a long time that we want to take the bird records from iRecord into bird track to be verified, and we haven't quite finished that one off yet, but that is still the plan to make that link in, in the other direction as well. One thing I wanted to do today was just to um, mentioned some of the other people that work on iRecord. Um, there, there is a whole team of us, uh, most of us based at UKCH, uh, and John Van Breeder, who's already been mentioned today, is one of our the main developers. John is not based at UKCH, he's an independent um, developer. Um, um, and I just really wanted to recognize all these wonderful people and the wonderful work that they do. Um, John and David Roy were the sort of instigators of iRecord going back about 12 or 13 years now, I think it is, maybe a bit more than that, and have been involved in it right from the start. I've been involved with it for the last, I know, 10 or 11 years, as have some of the other developers as well, and then more recently, Robin and Sam have joined the team. Um, and um, we have the good fortune to work on this system and try and keep it working for everybody else. And 
I've slightly artificially divided us into two groups, but um, the, the technical development team are all people with lots of knowledge and experience and expertise in biodiversity data, and the management and support team are all people who have um, a degree of technical knowledge as well, so we do sort of share roles quite a lot. But anyway, that's what we all look like. And um, we are there to try and keep this system running and to enable it to work with all the wonderful volunteers who get involved with adding the records in the first place, of course, and then with the recording schemes and the verification, which is nearly all done by volunteers. There are a few people who get involved in verification for particular projects who may be doing it as part of their job, but the vast majority of it is, is done by people working in a voluntary capacity. And for those of you who aren't verifiers, this is just a glimpse of what the verification part of iRecord looks like. When you go into this page as a verifier, you get to see the list of records that are waiting to be looked at. Um, if there's a photo, it will be displayed. The map on the right hand side shows the location of the record in the context of the other records of that species and all the details and the comments that people might have added to the records are there as well. So that's the sort of main tool that verifiers uh, are using. And what verifiers are actually trying to do, the, really the overriding task is to decide whether any individual record is acceptable for the recording scheme for which the verifier is verifying. Um, which is not quite the same as making a judgment as to, as to whether the record is absolutely correct or absolutely incorrect. It is making a judgment based on the evidence that's available as to whether the record is well enough evidenced um, to be useful and acceptable to the recording scheme. Obviously, if there's a photo, that can be checked to see whether the identification is correct. Um, but alongside that, or if there isn't a photo, then the things like the location, the date, are they likely, is it plausible that the record will have come from these places? Is the record from somebody who's a regular and very experienced recorder, or are they brand new to recording and might need a little bit more help to, to get things confirmed? So in order to sort out some of these questions, the verifier may need to query the record and to ask for more information. And of course, not all records can be accepted. Not all of them are able to provide enough evidence in the end to make the record acceptable. Um, but we've seen to date that most the, the, the number of records that can be accepted either immediately or following some queries is actually a very high proportion of them. There's a number of things that recorders can do to help verifiers with this process. And certainly if you found anything unusual, that might be a rare species or just something at an unusual place or time, providing a photo is really helpful in those circumstances and in information in the comments. On the other hand, if you're recording a very sort of familiar species that you've seen many times before and you see it many times again, you don't need to put a photo with every single occurrence of it. Um, once you verifiers will sort of realize that um, it's something that you know about and um, it's not a good use of your time nor necessarily of the verifier's time to add a photo for every single instance. Most recording schemes prefer recorders to give a full name if they can and um, there are some schemes that really sort of insist on that and will sometimes reject records if, if for instance a pseudonym has been used. Um, that is quite a sort of tricky area and there's a lot of different views out there and we're also well aware that particularly with an online public website, not everybody wants to make their full name sort of up there visibly visible in public, showing where they've been out and about recording and there are certainly very good cases where people might want to, want to conceal their identity in some way. Um, and I think this is a sort of evolving area that recording schemes probably themselves need to think a little bit more about how we deal with this. As I say, there is some quite mixed feelings at the moment. Um, also providing further details of location and stage and so on is all um, potentially very useful to help your record be checked and accepted. And somebody mentioned, I think it was John right at the beginning mentioned that there are these um, custom species reforms for particular species groups. So for instance, there's a form for dragonflies, there's a form for moths, there's a form for mosses and various others. So if you are focusing on a particular species group, it's worth checking to see if there's a, a, a form specifically for that group that will help you record the detail that's needed. Um, but if you're in any doubt over any of these things, the best thing to do is to contact the relevant recording scheme uh, and ask for their advice on how you could best provide your records.
verification one of the questions always comes up about i record is why aren't all the records verified and that the, the the obvious answer to that is that it is dependent on volunteers we don't have recording schemes for all the species groups not all recording schemes are, act are actively engaging with i record yet but the number is increasing and the blue um, bars on the chart here show the number of individual verifiers who've been active each year for the last 10 years and the number of records that are being verified and both are on the increase and we continue to work with recording schemes to bring new people on board on a very regular basis. The sort of headline figure at the moment is that 75%, three quarters of all the records in the Indicia database have been verified. So obviously that leaves a quarter of them that haven't yet been verified. Um, that's not quite spread evenly yet. Um, the iNaturalist element of the data that comes into Indicia is lagging behind at the moment for various reasons. Um, so um, there's, there's perhaps some more consideration to put to what we do with that. But overall, I think this is an encouraging people. And yet again, it shows the amount of work that is being put in um, by all the people that help with this. Um, this is the uh, an example from the um, another piece of work that Martha Henson has done for us recently, following on from the work that Martha described with butterfly conservation. We also asked Martha through some work we were doing with um, Natural England and DEFRA through their NCEA project uh, to consult more widely amongst the verifiers for, for groups other than butterflies and moths. So having had all the work done through butterfly conservation for butterflies and moths, we wanted to try and see if we were getting any different feedback or additional feedback from our other verifiers. So thanks to all the verifiers who took part in this. Um, quite encouragingly, there was a high level of agreement that I record is doing useful things for verifiers and that most people find it easy to use but not everybody agrees with either of these statements and this particular um, exercise has provided us with lots of information about why that might be. Um, Martha is just finalising the report um, this week so um, we're, we, we've got a lot to sort of read through and digest and work out what to do with it but we will be taking um, very seriously the, the, the results from this and seeing how we can make use of that to uh, make further improvements. The other sort of main aspiration of iRecord was to try and help make data more widely available and as we've already said the records coming in do become immediately available to participating national schemes and local record centres. Um, a lot of them are shared with the MBN Atlas. The route for doing that goes via the national recording schemes, and it is a bit variable. A lot of them use our automated process where the, the records get updated every month, more or less. Some download the data out of our record and transfer it into their own data systems and send it to MBN that way. Um, and there are some schemes um, that, that still aren't doing that. There are a few gaps and there are the ones that don't have schemes at all that we're, we're trying to find other ways of flowing that data. So there are gaps and there is still work to do here, but quicker data flow is um, being achieved, I think. And just as one demonstration, I had a quick look at all the Diptera records, that's the records of true flies on the MBN Atlas for 2020 up to date. And um, I think it was just under 80% of them have gone via one or other of the Indicia routes into the Indian Atlas. Um, so for recent records, at least, it is enabling this quick flow of data and sharing via the Indian Atlas. Okay, so for the last bit of the talk, I'm going to say a couple, a few things about what's coming up. And this first slide picks up on some um, sort of, I suppose, fairly ongoing things. One thing to announce right at the top here is that we have just signed off a new five-year programme with the Joint Nature Conservation Committee, um, the um, national government body that um, does a lot of um, support around nature conservation and data. And we've always worked closely with them, but as I say, we've just signed a new agreement, which does include support for the work of BRC generally, including iRecord and Indicia. The supporting science work has brought a lot of new features which are near to completion and going live. Some of them have just started to go live and there's a, there will be more appearing very soon. Um, we've got a bit more work to do around the providing help and guidance alongside that for the other taxon groups who will also be able to benefit from the butterfly conservation work, but that is on its way. Um, 
there are some continuing issues about around things like data quality and particularly we know that some sources come in with quite poor resolution grid references that cause problems for recording scenes and verifiers we need to do some more work on that and the overall performance of um, i record and websites requires continuous monitoring and um, our technical team put a lot of effort into tracking that and trying to make sure that we are keeping up with demand and every so often we do fall behind a little bit and we have to do things behind the scenes to catch up again and there is continually ongoing work to try and maintain that. But I wanted to pick up on three other things that are on the horizon that we want to um, talk to people about and find out how best to deal with them. Record Cleaner is a standalone bit of software that has long been used for checking biological records and looking at whether they're within their expected range or within the time of year. And these same rules have always been implemented in iRecord and anybody who uses iRecord will be familiar with seeing these notifications that pop up about things being out of range or whatever. Um, and as part of the work that Martha did recently, we've been asking people, asking our verifiers how helpful they find the record cleaner rules. And the answer to that is they don't always find them particularly helpful. And of course, there are species groups that don't have rules at all, but even for the ones that do, they're not necessarily um, providing as much support to the verifiers as we might hope. Um, so I think there's a number of things that we can think about to, to try and improve on this. And one of the things that supporting science has helped us develop is the ability for, for verifiers to upload the, their own set of custom rules if they don't feel that the national rules are picking out the right things. And there may be an opportunity to do some more work on Record Cleaner itself and move it away from being standalone software into some sort of web service. Very early days for that discussion, but it is. Next item that's been picked up in discussion already is, as well today is around the whole business of image recognition and automatic identification. This is now available in the iRecord apps or some of them certainly, and we are using some of the existing image classifiers. The Dutch OBS identify system is, is being used very widely in iRecord. We're also working with the PlantNet people. And the image recognition process is getting much more accurate uh, and it improves very quickly and we are working with the um, European teams who are building some of these systems to try and improve them further. But as we all know, they are not infallible. They work better for some species groups than for others. So there certainly isn't any case at the moment for replacing human verification with automatic image recognition across the board but there might be a place for allowing the image recognition to support human verification. And for instance, we might think about um, when, the verif when a verifier looks at a photo record, they might get a prompt as to whether the image classifier agrees with it or not. Um, and we don't know how helpful that will be, um, but it, it is at least a way of finding out um, how uh, sort of whether the verifiers themselves do agree with what the image classifier is telling them. And we might be able to build in some filtering options so that verifiers could pick out the records where the image classification thinks that it's, it's been wrongly identified. That might be useful for verifiers just to focus in and do a, a full check on those records. Um, so we've got some things here to think about and to discuss with everybody as to whether these would be useful or not. And the last thing that I wanted to pick up on was uh, sort of under the heading of data visualization, but also sort of feedback to schemes and recorders as to where their records are going and what's happening with them. And um, this is uh, another excuse on my part to get bee flies into <laughs> into the story here. The, the map we're looking at here is, is the bee fly map. And in fact, the orange dots on this map are where we've had new 10 kilometer records for bee flies this year. Despite the fact it's a very well recorded species, we're still getting new 10 kilometer square records, which is fantastic. That's not really the point, though. The point is that this these maps and phonology charts were added to iRecord quite recently, thanks to some work that Rich Berkmar did. And they they have added a little bit of extra data visualization, uh, but there's more we could do. Potentially, there's lots more we could do. But should we? How much of our resource should we put into doing this? How much of it is already out there on the MBN Atlas already, or via software that people are using themselves? And I think there's quite a lot of questions there about what are the most useful things we could do. Um, 
but this I also wanted to take this opportunity to highlight the very new um, BSBI Botanical Society at this, um, which has been published as a very large book, but also as a freely available website with some more of um, the visualizations that Rich Berkmar has working on with colleagues at UKCH and if you haven't had a chance to look at the online atlas yet it has an enormous amount of ways of displaying lots and lots of different information um, trends in the changes in the species the time of year that they recorded the altitudes at which they recorded it's a fantastic example of the sorts of things that you can do with biological data this is not linked to iRecord live um, it's linked to BSBI's own curated database of records um, but potentially some of these things could be linked to iRecord live um, and again the question arises as to whether there is it is worth us putting the effort into making that happen. So just to finish then, one last poll um, is to ask you, if you had the choice, what would you recommend we spend our time on basically? So we're gonna ask you to pick out the, which one feature you think is the most important um, for us to be working on at the moment. And I'd just be really interested to see, I guess this is a fairly unscientific sample of people, um, but I'd be really interested to see what people um, would initially pick out from the, the list that you've got here. I'm just going to read through the options, Martin, yeah. for the sake of the recording. Um, so the options that Martin's given, uh, like I, like he said, it's select select one, select your most desired. Uh, faster and more reliable website performance. We've got greater use of automatic photo identification. We've got simpler recording forms. Uh, and we've got the the converse of that, recording forms with more detail tailored to my species group. We've got extra tools for mapping and querying records, and then other. And if you've got another, please drop it in the chat. What I might do is while you're finishing off that vote, if there's any dropped in the chat, I'll read them out. Right, okay, I think we've got pretty much everybody there. So uh, share the results, Martin. Do you want to talk us through the results? Okay, so um, number one on the uh, list of choices is for a faster and more reliable website performance. Um, and I can entirely understand why that is a popular choice. There, there have been times when iRecord has run very unhelpfully slowly. Um, I think it's running reasonably well just at the moment, but there is definitely room for improvement. And it is something that you'll be um, hopefully pleased to hear is already in the pipeline. It is being worked on. There are a, a number of quite complicated IT things that we have to work with our other colleagues in UKCH to get in place to make the next big step in performance. Um, but work is underway to make that happen. Second on the list are the extra tools for mapping and querying records. So that's linking to the sort of data visualization side of things. Um, so that's good to see that there's some support for that, but we need to work with all of you to find out exactly what will be the most useful tools that we might think about doing. Um, and then we've got recording forms with more detail for the species groups. And I think part of that issue is how we actually signpost people to use the best forms for what it is that they're recording, because um, there's quite a complexity of different forms out there. Greater use of automatic photo identification. Now, my question's not very clear there about whether people are wanting greater use from the recorder's perspective or from the verifier's perspective or from some other perspective, but there is at least some support in continuing to investigate that. Simpler recording forms, a few people for, and I'll be interested to see the others when we get to see the, the final comments as well. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, we will try and do some wider consultations around some of these things and perhaps try and get a bit more feedback from people as to how we should prioritize some of the work that we do because we can't do everything all at once, unfortunately. Um, so I just want to finish again by thanking um, Kieran at NFBR and for Biological Record Centre for supporting all of us to do the seminar today. We asked you why iRecord. We've had some really good examples of the way that people have been using iRecord and thank you to everybody who's taken part in that. Um, I'm well aware that iRecord is just a tool to help us do biological recording. It's the recording that's the important thing and we hope that we can continue to help um, 
make recording work for people and to make the data available for all the wonderful uses to which it can be put by local record centers, by conservationists, by researchers, and even internationally. And iRecord is all about trying to make the links um, here so that this can happen whilst at the same time we're all out there enjoying seeing our wildlife in the first place. Um, so, and I know that iRecord has its frustrating elements and we will continue to try and respond to those as best we can. Please keep the feedback coming to us. We really do value that and we do read all the comments that come to us. So just to do the final thanks to our funders, of course, um, and we do get funding from a range of sources, um, but there are three here that have been particularly significant in recent years, at least, and will be and certainly with the JNCC work is, as I say, is, is um, just going into a new phase. Thanks to all the people who actually send in the records and, of course, a very big thank you to the um, national and local recording schemes and verifiers who have that job of um, checking and, and dealing with all of them. Do get in touch with us if you have any further feedback. Um, but yeah, thanks also for your time this morning, and I hope you've enjoyed um, the the whole of the, the seminar. And I will.